The Week in Bible Prophecy, a Prophecy Watchers podcast. Well, welcome to the podcast today, everyone. I'm Ana Gonzalez here in studio with Doug Van Dorn, who's written a book called Giants, Sons of the Gods. And uh, welcome, Doug. Yeah, thanks, Mondo. It's gonna this game should be really fun, man. Yeah, we've we've, we've done a, a couple other uh, programs and had some great conversation about this topic. And uh, you know, right, right out of the gate here, Doug, where can people find out more information about you uh, and the ministry you're doing and, yeah. and some of the topics you're discussing? Uh, well, my personal website is douglasvandorn.com. I used to have Doug Van Dorn, but then I was an idiot and let it go and lost all that clout. So Douglas Van Dorn. So now that's just my legal name, I guess. And um, so that's where you can find my books. My, all my books are at Amazon. Uh, and then also... And Prophecy uh, Watchers as well now. And pl- Prophecy Watchers. <laughs> at, least well, one, at least one is, of them. At least we'll hopefully get so some far, more in yeah, there, right? Exactly. Um, and then uh, plug our church, uh, the Reformed Baptist Church in Northern Colorado. So we're north of Denver, um, kind of in Boulder, between Boulder Longmont. But on that website, rbcnc.com, we have... Almost every sermon I've ever done, many, many of them are in PDF and audio. And I know people can't believe this, but like I'm kind of meticulous about my notes, even with my <laughs> sermons. It's kind of insane. And that's just how I have learned to uh, to remember where all the stuff is that I'm learning. And so uh, those are all free for people to download. So if you find a weird topic that we're talking about and I've preached on it, and uh, chances are that it's there and you can go look it up for free. Yeah, it, it's amazing too. So the, the work that you've done here in the Giants book, uh, you know, several hundred at least <laughs> footnotes where it, to me it's like, oh, this is great. I have the, I have several in you know, the underline. I'm like, okay, this is great. You know, so it's, it's tremendous. So let's, let's, let's jump right in. The, the Genesis 6 narrative, uh, it kind of has become, it's become more popular. For sure. For sure, yeah. For sure. Uh, but there still are those, it, it, kind of people love it or hate it. And I like to, um, I, I like, to, let, let's give the foundation first, because the next thing I want to talk about is those that hate it. And that, that's good. We love them. There are brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's fine. But Genesis 6 as a foundational chapter, it, it appears right there. Uh, let's talk maybe briefly here, not even briefly, whatever. The connection between what we see in Genesis 3 into Genesis 6, and then maybe even to Genesis 14. Sure. Um, you know, I, I once listened to a guy giving the whole Sethite theory uh, view, and one of the things he said about why he takes that view instead of the supernatural is that he goes, well, prior to Genesis 6, there's nothing supernatural in the whole Bible. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is literally what he said. I'm like, have you never read Genesis 2? Who do you think is walking around in the garden with Adam and Eve? Have you never read Genesis 3? Who do you think that is in the garden with the woman? You think it's literally a talking snake? Does not the rest of the Bible tell you that it's a supernatural entity? What do you think that that was that he stationed at the door of the gate of the Garden of Eden to Cherubim? I mean, it's not like this comes out of the blue. Yeah. So there's your connection. And then there's this prophecy in Genesis 3.15 of this seed war that's coming. And so the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, but he will bruise your heel. And so this has to find its way playing out somewhere. So I think it plays its way out on a spiritual and a physical level. You know, spiritually, Jesus talks about Pharisees are children of the devil. Yeah, no no doubt that's true. So there's that part, but there's also the physical part of it, right? That that uh, there are supernatural entities that take physicality in, you know, they, they eat with Abraham, yep. they have their feet washed, um, all kinds of things. They wrestle with Jacob. Um, that's not a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> it's a WWE match. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, uh, that physicality starts being played out in Genesis 6, and that sets up the rest of the Bible for, for that war. You know, I think that's that's worth revisiting in the sense that, uh, or, or restating, because what I have seen, and I've been addressing this in a different format, is that exact thing, is that, hey guys, um, Genesis, you, you can't have it both ways. I think hermeneutics is about being consistent. I think that's probably the probably one of the greatest uh, uh, categories is, is this consistent. And so in Genesis 3.15, oh, well, we have... Um, 
we have the the physical seed of of of, of Eve, which we know is the physical seed ends up in exactly. Jesus, right? So, and exactly. then all of a sudden, Zerah, the, the the Hebrew word, it's like okay, well here it means physical, and over here it means spiritual, right. because it is true in First John, it is right. You have the, the hey, if anybody sins, they're of the devil, they're of the, you know, you know whatever. So we're not, but. We're not denying that there is a spiritual component, you know, that we are by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2, 1 John 5, children of the devil, with that language is there. But now we're reading New Testament theological language back on the Hebrew of Genesis 3.15, where, no, this is, this is physical. We have, we are, our physical world, uh, there's people from outside of the physical, the, the, the world that we see uh, that are interlopers or they're they're coming into our world right there again even genesis 3 1 you have this creature that uh took the form and the nakash right took a form of a serpent whatever but it was still physical she wasn't it wasn't a vision is what i'm saying yeah right it wasn't just in her head it wasn't just in her head yeah so we have this uh in the old testament through i think one of the interesting things is in in second king six we know the passage where Elisha says, "Lord, open his eyes to the servant to, right, exactly, to see." Exactly. So there's things that are that are there, but there's there's this realm that's being blocked. Somehow he was not able. His eyes, whether it's uh, if we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum that he's below visible sight, whatever, however it is, yeah. um, a radio wave that we can't see is just as physically real as the visible light spectrum of let's say 500 nanometers right so it's just it's physical we just our eyes aren't able to, yeah, to see yeah. it right so you have these other things that are happening that's why you need a radio telescope mm. it's still physical yeah so to me this is fascinating but you also have the foundational thing of uh, the foundational messaging the theological mes messaging genesis 6 there kind of lays there and, and then we see it how else do we see it in the sense of the rest of the the old testament narrative well, like you said, Genesis 14 sort of starts us off because Abraham comes in the promised land and then his nephew is stolen away and there's this war, uh, you know, that's all going on there. Well, who are these people? Well, if you start yeah. looking into who these people the are. The Rephaim, right? They, yeah. are, they are giants. Uh, the whole thing is about giant clans. And so that's actually telegraphing stuff that you'll find later with Moses because he starts fighting or, or hearing about these exact same tribes. And in those contexts, it's very clear that they're giant tribes. I mean, you have the Ammonites and the Moabites that are killing these very same people, uh, the Zamzamim, like they appear yep. in both of these places, right? Yep. Well, who are they? Well, they're giants. I mean, it tells you that that's what they Deuteronomy are. Deuteronomy 2 and 3. If you're, if you're listening to this, read Deuteronomy exactly. 2 and 3, and you'll be like, what? I never knew that was in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. You, that you will not. It's amazing, amazing how Moses says, yeah, these guys were there, but they, they got, you know, the, the, the sons of Esau took care of them before. We didn't have to worry about those guys. Yep. But as they come up from the southwest to the southeast, up north, into Bashan, Og, talk about him for a minute. Well, he's the king of Bashan. He reigns over the whole area of Mount Hermon. The whole area, Bashan itself, can mean the place of the serpent. Uh, the watchers are, and sons of God uh, are serpentine creatures. Uh, they're actually depicted this way in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Pseudepigrapha. So this is a guy who is the progeny. Probably very early progeny. We don't know how early. It talks about king of the Rephaim. King, he or the last of king, the. He's the last of the Rephaim. Uh -huh. I mean, so this is like somebody who's going way, way back. I mean, there's all kinds of funny legends about him uh -huh. that he lived through the ark, uh, mm -hmm. through the flood on the ark, he and held stuff on. like that. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. And Noah fed him through a hole in, in the ark <laughs> and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so Moses goes into this area that's controlled by him, and he absolutely obliterates him because he would not let Israel pass through. Yep. It's to me what. Uh, it, it, to getting into some of the linguistics, which I think is 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 fun for people, is that what I have found is that if you look at the first five books, uh, uh, you know, call the Torah, the Pentateuch, whatever, Rephaim has a very specific meaning to these phys these physical giants. Now later, as we know, if if you if you look at it from a, like what they what scholars will call a diachronic perspective, later Rephaim has way different meanings. You know, uh, the, the spiritual spiritual people, ghosts, the other words it uses in the Book of Isaiah. But if you look just in the Pentateuch, I don't see any spiritual dead there. These are physical guys. Later, again, the word the word morphs, and I think it's referencing the same beings, but just a different aspect of their location and their and their existence and their existence. Yeah. yeah. So, so Rephaim is, is this word, first appears in Genesis 14, but it's foundational here right there because it sets the tone 
let, let's, in, in the last couple minutes here of this segment, um, how does it set the tone for the rest of the Bible, Goliath and, and the biblical history? People don't realize this. I had, a, I had a fellow I was teaching this to in a Bible study, and he had just had brain surgery. And uh, he would fall asleep every time I talked about this subject. Um, we might talk about this later, about some of the weird reactions people have to this. I mean, okay, some yeah. people get viscerally angry. And well, his re- reaction was to fall asleep, and he wouldn't do this at other times. Finally, I just looked at him and said, man, what are you doing? What is your problem? He goes, this is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And I said, really? I said, don't you believe in Goliath? He goes, well, yeah. I said, he's a giant, right? He said, well, yeah. I said, you ever looked at his lineage? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? Well, th- this got him because he loves genealogy. Okay. okay. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he's one of those kind of science math guys, uh-huh. and he loves them. And so I said, well, go look into it. You'll find that he's descended from the Rephaim, who are Nephilim. Yep. And as soon as I said that, light light went off in his head. He got and it. And he it, it clicked on, and he became the greatest apologist for giants that I've ever seen. I mean, he just absolutely saw how important the subject was. Yeah, you know, and that's 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 often the case. If people can get over some of that initial uh, reaction, when non-supernatural tra- traditions that come in, because again, it, this is a can of worms. It, it is. opens a can of worms into understanding, well, how can angels, angels, Matthew 22, 30 says, the angels in heaven, they, they, they don't, they're not married or given a marriage. So clearly this is wrong. Well, maybe that's something we could talk about in, in the next here a second. Well, let, let's do that right now, actually. Um, so let's talk about some of the objections. And, and I want to talk about the Sethite theory as well. But Matthew 22, 30. Yeah. Okay. Clearly you guys are off your rocker talking about Genesis 6 because Jesus said, Angels in heaven do not marry or give in a marriage. Therefore, Genesis 6 is not about angels. What's, how do we respond Yeah, I'm that? glad you quoted that properly. Properly, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you did. Yep. So it says angels in heaven. So who's that talking about? It's talking about unfallen, loyal angels. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because they're, they don't want to sin. That's why they don't do this. That doesn't mean that they can't do it. Uh, why are angels called men? And why are men called men? So there's one Hebrew word that we do not share with angels, and there's another that we do share. So all humans from Adam are called Adam, but angels and humans are both called Ish. And that word Ish is always translated as men. And so when you look at the Sodom and Gomorrah story, for example, at one point it says they're angels, (coughs) at another point it calls them men. Well, if they're men, and then they go into the town and they want to have sexual relations with his daughters, what do you think that that means? So uh, those are very clearly angels in that story. So to use Jesus is, in that sense is just completely taking him out of context, and it's making, it's making him say something he doesn't. Fallen, the idea is that fallen, sinful creatures did something that they're capable of doing because they're evil. Yeah. And secondly, I think if we go in, in handling that objection of Matthew 22, is you say, well, uh, if you look at 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6, there the language is these, these and it, get, it lumps them into this category, which we'll talk about some hierarchy in a minute, but uh, these angels that sinned left their domain. They left yeah, their realm. Their proper say, domain, their that's proper, right. Yeah, so they, these angels that sinned, we're not like the unfallen angels in heaven that didn't leave their right. proper domain and realm and then go, as Jude says, to commit sexual immorality just as Sodom and Gomorrah, strange or, or, or foreign flesh mm-hmm. or non-consistent, uh, whatever, that's, whatever that, that, that nature. They violated their nature by joining with this other nature. Yeah, there's a, uh, this works both ways. So you go and read the, the law in Leviticus, and in chapters 18 and 20 especially um, are talking about uh, these uh, crossing over sins that you can commit. Mm-hmm. Well, why would God forbid us from necromancy and us from witchcraft and us from uh, contacting the dead? Why would he do that? Because you can do that. It's just that it's forbidden it's from forbidden, doing. Yep. Uh, and so that's their side of it is to come down here. Our side of it is to try and cross over there. Yep. And uh, you know, we're seeing a whole lot of our side of it we're probably actually seeing a whole lot of both of these sides these days. Yeah, but. it seems that, they, 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 again, it's, as you mentioned, definitely possible. And uh, we talked about this yesterday, just in the sense of, you know, God saying, no, this is forbidden because it, it will only lead to disaster. 
It will only lead to deception. It will only lead to them gaining a foothold into your life. And God saying, you as my people, I know what's best for you. And therefore, it's a death penalty. We're, and it's zero tolerance. And mm -hmm. that's amazing because God knows that, uh, again, you know, from we see this with the psychics today in my mind is that, oh, well, we're going to go, I'll, I'll bring up, you know, you know, your cousin, your, your boy, that your child that died. And you're like, no, it's a lie. They're going to come up and pretend to be the little boy. My, my sisters, when they were younger, when I was younger, I had become a Christian. They were playing with the Ouija board. And the Ouija board, it was, a, it was like a nine-year-old boy that was, was telling him things that nobody could know. Yeah. It was amazing. And they're like, no, no, it's fine. I go, no, it's not. And they're going, well, it's a nine-year-old nine boy. I go, no, the, 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 this spirit yeah. is yeah. masquerading and getting you hooked in. Yeah. And of course, you know, complete disaster after that. Um, so to me, it's like, yes, there's a spiritual realm and, and that's there. And they're trying to cross over. And, and that's forbidden for, and, and these loyal angels in Matthew 22 are not doing that, but others chose to. Exactly. Yeah. So let's, let's continue on with a little bit of the objections. Um, don't you know, Doug, come on, let me inform you here. <laughs> these are just, these are just sons of Seth. This is this, these are Sethites. They're ungodly. They're, I mean, the Seth, these were obedient sons of God that simply chose to look, to go find the most beautiful women, which just happened to be all sinners. So now uh, all, all beautiful right. women exactly. are sinners. So exactly. It, it's the Sethite theory that that's around, but I think people believe it just because that's what they've heard. Yeah. So how do we, how do we help bring them out of that tradition and say, Let's just read the text in one sense. Well, that, the word tradition is interesting because a lot of people, I think, hold it because it's tradition. Um, so one of the things that you can go after is the fact that this was not the tradition until it was changed to mm -hmm. be the tradition. So for longer than America has been a country, the entire church was uniform on believing the supernatural view of this. So, so let's explain that then. The early church, first 300 years of the church, yeah. and we're not, we can talk about the Jews, what they believe too. They believed in the, in the supernatural view, which is what specifically? Just, just so people can catch. So the supernatural view is that sons of God are um, heavenly beings. Um, Precision, I appreciate it. And uh, sometimes, you know, they, they're given other names. Watchers is one that you find, and that's a biblical term that comes from Daniel 4. Um, and these heavenly beings saw human women. And when you read the text very carefully, you see that that's what's going on because it starts off that when man began to multiply in the face of the land, that word is not ish, it's Adam. Um, so when Adam, men, humans began to multiply, daughters were born to them, not to, not to Cain, but to them. Adam's physical offspring, all of them. All of them are having daughters. That's what it says. And so those daughters that are being seen in the text have to be the daughters of men. That means whoever the sons of God are have to be something else. And, of course, we know that there's something else from every other time that this phrase is yep. used in the Old Testament. It always means angels. It's almost always translated as angels in the Septuagint. Yeah, it really. Yeah, Job 1, Job 2, Job 38. You guys can look this up. It's very clear. Yep. So uh, that's the idea, is that um, it, it's a supernatural and a natural mixing. Heaven and earth coming together, creating this monstrosity. So, so let me interrupt for a second as well, because the idea that... It mentions daughters, females, uh, being now females are born to this special group of God's creation, uh, referring to Adam. Okay. Yes. Well, is there any evidence anywhere else that there's females in God's existence, any other beings he's ever created that are, have a female nature to them that we know about? This is an interesting question. I think it's debatable. Okay. My opinion is that yes. Okay. Um, and the reason why is just think about somebody like Asherah. Okay. Asherah is a goddess, and um, she's worshipped by Israel. Uh, she's not a god. She's a goddess. Um, you, have, I mean, you have all kinds of different entities. M many of them are probably more demonic. So like the Lilith. Right. Uh, it's female. It's you know. female. You got the stork women in Zechariah. Yeah. Those, are, those are females. But uh, just the whole idea of, of a goddess worship that was so prevalent. Um, especially in Israel in the north, which is interesting because this is kind of where the whole thing happened. Uh, you know, it doesn't answer the question about Genesis 6 and male and female, well, but it, I, it does tell you I, that there are I probably guess, female entities, unless they're like masquerading as transsexuals true, or something. Right, which we, we do see that, some trans <laughs> stuff. But I guess what I'm saying is that if the angels in heaven 
had female angels that were beautiful, then they wouldn't need to be looking at human human females. That that's kind of where I was oh, going. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't need to. They wouldn't. But need to. Why do men lust and look at porn? I mean, <laughs> they don't need to, well, right? Because I, I it's a I'd, sin. I guess I'd be interested to see what a female <laughs> angel could look like. Yeah, I don't you know. know. And I don't ma- know. Maybe I might lust at that point, but <laughs> hopefully not. But uh, in, anyway, go, going back, you have the Sethite. Let, let's continue down that. I'm sorry for my interruption. But I was just curious. So we're reading the text, and and where do people get Sethite here? Well, they get it from uh, looking at later passages um, and reading back theology into Genesis 6 mm-hmm. that I don't think you can justify doing just from the context. So you go to Ezra, for example, when, they, when Israel comes back into the land, they start, the Jews start marrying the pagans of the, country, of, of, the, of the nations, and God gets furious at it. So that's believers marrying unbelievers. Well, so what happens is, for whatever reason, that became the popular view of what's taking place in Genesis 6. But like I said, that's anachronistic. I mean, that's something that's taking place way, way later. Um, and you just you, you cannot justify it in the language of Genesis 6 itself. It doesn't say daughters of Cain. It says daughters of Adam. It doesn't say sons of Seth. It says sons of Elohim. Yep. Um, so that's just what it says. I mean... If yeah, we get, really would have to be reading into it. The word Cain doesn't appear. Does the, not appear. The word Seth doesn't appear. And like you said earlier, what that does to all of these Sethites, like they're all these godly, how can they be godly if this is what they're doing? Yep. And then you think about what it says for only the daughters of of, uh, of Cain. Cain. Like none of the daughters of Seth are doing anything wrong. Yep. I mean, just think about how bizarre this is in terms of a theology of sin. Yeah, and the theology of genetics or family lines, I think the other nature of theological kind of absurdity is that when do we have um, believers and unbelievers, you know, as a believer, if I was to marry an unbeliever, I'm not going to get a giant offspring. How does that come to be? Exactly. (laughs) Well, that's the other thing is that people have changed the meaning of the word Nephilim Mm -hmm. so that the word now just means a fallen one. And they get that from something that seems reasonable. That there's a Hebrew word nephal that means to fall, and so nephalim. It seems like that could be reasonable. The At problem, first glance, yeah. yeah. The problem is that we actually have an alternative spelling in the Bible, in Numbers thirteen thirty three, that cannot account for that um, verbal use of that word or or word as a noun. And the only explanation that makes sense is that it's actually an Aramaic word. That was inserted into the text to help the people understand in their day what it means, and it the word means a giant. Yeah, see, and see, that's that's the beautiful thing, and and um, you know, in the sense of Hebrew being, you know, Hebrews for those that don't know this, Hebrew has you know three three letters is is it forms most of their their words, but then consonants and then in the middle you have all these different vowels right. that can that can you know that you weren't w- written down until a exactly. thousand years ago uh, yep. you know because they just knew what they were so yep. these Masorites can they can yep. put whatever vowels they want I mean to we in have there. like sing sng i use this example sng we have sing we have song we have sang we have maybe if you sung uh, so yeah, we yeah, just by changing yeah. the vowels there but it's a three letter root and that's how hebrew works so you can tell very clearly based on the vowel that's in there whether it's a participle whether it's a noun or whatever and so hebrew works this way but to me it's fascinating that if we just simply read the text and let's remind people here that hey in the first century the time of jesus jews or the church they all all All, believed 100 percent, 100 percent that we know and i also want to just point out the obvious here we have not gone to enoch or jubilees or anything else to prove this all we're doing is looking at the scripture yep exactly and and so people say, oh, you know the the greatest tradition. If you want to follow tradition, it, it, to me, you go back to the first century, and uh, you that's the oldest. And then it changed. And so the, you know, pe- I think people need to know that that if you want to go back to the most ancient, there's a good article. You know, at, at the ancient exegesis of the, of Genesis six, it's very well done. There's actually a dissertation that's uh, newer than that article by a uh, scholar in the Netherlands or Belgium or something. I think he's, he's a Dutch guy. That I think he's in Belgium, but. Um, his name is Yap Dodens, did an entire dissertation on ancient the, exegesis, the, the ah. ancient exegesis of this. And wow. it's online. You can go look it up at academia. Yeah, that, see, this, this, is, this is the key, is, is we, 
We're not here to read into the text, and I think if you look at some of these other objections, they really don't hold water. And I think it it takes away from the the rest of the narrative, which we're going to get to uh, in a moment. But let's let's talk for now. The, the kind of a, a topic that I think is fun is um, non human. So in, in God's world. We have humanity, so let's look at everything else. Everything else. Everything else that's not human. Let's talk <laughs> about having a, a hierarchy. Okay. So uh, what are some, and there, there's a distinction here as well, if people read into this, uh, the, the, the Old Testament uses Hebrew language and it describes certain beings. The New Testament uses Greek language to describe certain non-human beings, and sometimes they don't match perfectly. They're not contradictory, but it's in the sense of some are a little sometimes bit more, are more generic, more generic than specific. Versus, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the New Testament's a little bit more generic in, in, in what I'm in my research. But let's talk about hierarchy. So you have God; he's he's he stands alone. There's nobody like him. Right. There he is. Okay, number one. Number one, non-God and non-human. Who's number one on the? Can we know? And, okay, and so this is interesting. Uh, the Canaanites actually have this. A guy named Lowell Handy, I think, was his name. Uh, put together a, a book called "The Host of Heaven," something like that. Mm-hmm. And he shows what the Canaanite hierarchy was. And so at the top of their hierarchy, and their their uh, polytheist is El, the 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 mighty god, the well, uncreated creator, the, kind of basically. Uh, well, he's. He, he's probably the creator God, but he himself comes from someone else. Uh, okay. So this is what's so, so they don't this even have is so what's before. important. Okay, okay. Is that, yeah, he comes from someone else, but he's the high God of the divine council. Underneath him are the 70 sons of El and Asherah. So Asherah is his consort. They have 70 sons. Baal's one of them. Yom, the sea God, is one of them. Uh, these are the princes of the nations. Underneath them, I think that you have a craftsman the deities. The artisan, artisan uh-huh. group, yep. And then underneath them, you have angels. And uh, that's just simply a word that means a messenger, even for Canaanites. So they essentially had a four-tier like a servant, cosmology like a, yeah, lower, on the other mm-hmm, side, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, an angel is just a function that they, they, they go and give a message. Yep. So uh, I think that the Bible mirrors this quite well, except at the top. Where Yahweh, who's sometimes called El, even yeah, for sure. is the uncreated God who has nothing that was before Him. That's the key difference between biblical religion and all other uh, polytheistic religion, Mormonism, the, anything, yep. ancient Egyptian, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But under in the Bible, underneath God is the sons of God. So it's actually exactly yep. parallel. And the sons of God are these guys in Genesis 6. Why, why would they be the high, uh, the top? Because they're sons, sons mm-hmm. of the father. What would that make them? If, if the father's the king, what would that make them? Princes. Yep. And so here they're called princes, for example, in Daniel yep. 10, right? Uh, prince of Persia, prince yep. of Greece, chief prince princes, of yeah, Israel, yep. chief prince, all this uh-huh. kind of stuff. Uh, it's debated whether or not um, the Bible has the craftsman deity tier, but certainly underneath them we have the angelic tier. Uh, and in the Old Testament, that word especially refers to a function, yeah. an angel is a messenger. My personal opinion is that at some point in time, as the a language is moving into Greek and they're translating the Septuagint, that those uh, translators chose the word angel to substitute for the sons of God and for a whole host of other yeah, they did. Entities. It became generic. It became, became very generic. Broad. Yeah. And people ask why that is, and I think it's for the same reason that I do it. Because when I tell somebody that there are gods in the Old Testament, they instantly freak out. But as soon as I tell them, well, they're just angels, they go, oh, okay, no problem. They're spiritual beings. You believe in other spiritual beings? Everybody See, says yes. I don't yes. think that there's anything new under the sun, and I have a feeling that those Jewish translators were like, yeah, angel's a good word to yeah, use yeah, here. <laughs> exactly. Because, well, let's let's talk about that for a minute, because that's true. It, the If you go into really... Uh, we talked about this in different contexts earlier. It, it, going to the, the rabbis, uh, they didn't like even the, the two powers. You know, Alan Segal, his book. Right. You know, the two. They 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 moved away from that the two powers of heaven idea, which shows you that there's these other these other beings there. Yes. And they're like, well, we can't have other Elohim, and so they and then they made them judges, right? And the human right. judges, human judges. So even there, they're 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 looking at humanity. They're I don't know. They're trying to protect protect God. Let's say they are, but by doing that, they're removing. They're violating really the text by trying to protect God. If they're if they're doing if that was their motive, and they're also destroying. Well, first of all, I think it's 
I'm not going to attribute good motives to them for Fair this enough. because they <laughs> they Jesus Jesus is very clear about what they did. Yeah, uh, they rejected him as their Messiah. Yep, and he says they're sons of the devil, and yep. this will not be forgiven them. Yep, it's very serious. You're of the Father, of the absolute and, John. And eight. Yep. Because Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, I think that that was where the attack took place. But it does something else that um, for Christians uh, is really interesting because it destroys our ability to understand the sons of God worldview that's in the scripture. So Mm -hmm. there's a reason why Christians are called in Romans, Galatians, sons of God. And it's not accidental to the whole sons of God in Genesis 6. What it is, is it's a reversal or a disinheriting of the heavenly sons of God and a replacing with adopted humans to take their place the, in the, ones, the divine council. So let's 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 clarify that the the sons of God. Would you say that there are in this divine council sons of God that there, there are still some that are loyal? Or did all of them bail? No, absolutely, there are some that okay. are loyal. So we're going to be yeah. replacing the ones that, that are that, disloyal. That disloyal. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean that that's kind of an interesting question of the seventy ruling the seventy nations. Are they all evil? Probably. Um, are they all equally evil? I don't think so. I think some of them are way worse than others. Yep. But they're all, all those are being disinherited. But this wasn't like plan B because Adam, Adam in the garden was put on the cosmic mountain, which is where the divine council was. He was given a seat at the table. And I think that the whole, one of, well, one of the main reasons for the fall is that Satan didn't like this. He didn't want a, a ball of mud ruling with him <laughs> yep. on this earth that he doesn't have any right to. Yep. And so he gets cast off the mountain out of Eden, and then God gives the nations over to these heavenly beings as yeah. punishment, really. Yeah. But the New Testament is all about the reversal of this. So when Jesus sends out the 70 disciples, yeah. Okay. This is, I mean, this is divine counsel stuff. I mean, it is. And then they come back and like, the, the demons are subject to us in your name, yeah, right? Yeah, that's amazing. So, and then, uh, you know, Paul says things like, don't you know you will judge angels? Well, what's that all about? That's a, that is the reversal. This is, this is, these guys are being disinherited. They're losing their power. And at the end of the day, Christ's church is going to be the one that, that um, replaces it. You know, uh, I want to revisit that uh, because there's some interesting stuff that I would love to talk about that. This relates to the mission of Jesus as well and, and, and the New Testament. Um, so going back to the hierarchy for a second, this is, this is fun. We have this, so from God now, you have the sons of God, this, this group of, that are labeled sons of God yeah. uh, in the divine council. Uh, where do the cherubim and the seraphim who are labeled yeah where, where do they they, they their question. loyalty i mean they, they're guardian something they're guarding yeah. god something where, where do you think they fit at in the hierarchy so my opinion is that almost all of these terms except sons of god are and even that to some degree are really functional terms okay so a cherubim is a guardian that's mm-hmm. a functional activity it doesn't necessarily tell us anything about what its ontology is what kind of a being it is the same thing would be for, true for a seraphim although that one is probably a little less functional a seraphim is like a fiery yeah. creature right? Seraph, yeah, yeah but yeah. they're also guardians of the throne in isaiah 6. so you know over and over we hear about the host of heaven mm-hmm. so there's got to be all kinds of creatures to me the ufo thing could actually probably come into this yeah. you know the the different types of beings that people report in in ufology i don't have any problem with that um just that so as long as we understand that in the scripture these entities are aliens right they don't not, belong they're, here they're not human, they're yep. Not human. Yep, yep. and they uh they have a whole bunch of different functions that they do uh, in scripture so um in the sense of if i was to uh we we have in the new testament the 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 term archangel a couple times yes uh we have michael being called the archangel in jude but he's also called one of the chief princes in 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 daniel 10 so that prince so help me we have <laughs> so watcher sons of god prince chief prince now um Archangel, where, where do you put all them at? Great question. Um, <laughs> it's hard, I know. It is hard. Me. And part of it's hard because uh, the Bible just doesn't say a lot, but we have a ton of speculation on these things that sometimes contradict themselves yeah. outside the Scripture. So, if, for example, you have these four archangels in Roman Catholic theology, right? Mm-hmm. Raphael and, yep. and the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? <laughs> exactly. And uh, 
And um, so the question is, the Bible only talks about one archangel, only one, yeah, and it's had, Michael. That's all we get, yep. And so are there other archangels? I don't know. I mean, maybe. Uh, certainly, I believe there are loyal angels, and they're very high up, and so I don't have a problem with that. But it's to me, that remains speculation, just because I don't take those as inspired. Right. Um, so, so, so hold on for a second. Let me, let me clarify something. We have archangel comes from the New Testament. Um, in, in Daniel 10, Hebrew, he, Michael, one of the chief princes, plural. So if he's archangel in the New Testament, we don't want to force it. We don't want to read it back onto the Old Testament necessarily. Sure. But would that mean that in, if, if Michael then has that office or function of being a chief prince, but that's plural in the Old Testament, but we see it once he's labeled archangel, would that mean or imply that there are other archangels, even though they're not named because of that connection? I don't necessarily have a problem with the 70 being archangels. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, I mean, like, the, that's, it, like I said, it's speculation. Michael is very interesting. To, I, I actually... V- pretty strongly believe that Michael is Christ. Okay, okay. Um, a lot of people have a problem with this because Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, yeah, and of course they okay. believe he's created, right? But that's not necessary. Plenty of people in church history believe he's And you wrote, um, just, you wrote a book on this. Yeah, I, The Angel of the Lord. I okay, wrote it with okay. a fellow pastor friend of mine. And uh, he actually takes the opposite view on this. So we have a little appendix in the back where I give my arguments. He gives okay, his okay, minor way better than his. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> but or, the, else you, or else you change him. The <laughs> main argument that I use for why this is is actually... Um, Daniel, uh, Daniel 12, because he's the prince of Israel. Now, it does say he's one of the princes, but okay, so what? There's there's 70 princes, and Israel's the 71st nation, right? But it's mm-hmm. a special nation, yep. and Deuteronomy 32, 9 is very important it, here, it because is, yep. when it says that, and the Lord's portion is Israel, and Jacob is his inheritance, that has to mean that 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 Yahweh there is the son has to not because sons inherit things not fathers yep. and so that means that the son of God is the prince of Israel mm. in Deuteronomy thirty two nine but that means that Michael has to be the same entity unless for some special reason Israel has two princes over yeah it. well it's, it's it is interesting too because you think uh, uh, in the sense of watcher. Uh, you know, only appears in Daniel four, at least in the Bible, and uh, maybe, yeah, maybe there's some debatable uh, oh, some other uses of it. Okay, yeah, yeah. I could see that. Uh, so, you know, where, where are they at in the hierarchy? Where would a watcher? I think that a watcher is a son of God. Yeah, that's and that's I think I that mean. it's a, it's another title of function. What are yep. they? In fact, I just saw a movie uh, I think last night where they were talking about they just use a different word for watcher, like somebody who is seeing us or something like yeah, that right here you know because you're, what are they doing yeah, yeah. and this is a lot what people report in the ufos like they're not doing anything they're just watching us yeah. huh that's interesting and we know that uh, <laughs> you know if if we were again we haven't brought up enoch but in that sense uh the sons of god in in genesis 6 they're called watchers in in, in, in all, enoch. almost all the rest of the yeah. pseudepigrapher uses that language. yeah so th- so they're they're equating watcher with sons of god yes, which which is would be really uh, fascinating you know again well this is this i want to come bring up another topic here because um, we could be here all day, which is fun, but uh, the idea that this this generic flavor, which I've seen, and I, I try to help correct it if I hear it, that demons are simply just fallen angels. Again, fallen angels that means anything bad, and, and that's that's anything non-human that's bad is a fallen angel. Again, very generic, very broad. But don't you know that fa- those broad, that very broad fallen angel being category, whatever, those are just demons too. So they're kind of mixing them together. How do we, you know, how do we correct that? So let's let's talk about uh, first of all. Does the Bible, does the Bible alone? We're not going to look at anywhere else. Tell us exactly where demons come from. Does it tell us where demons come from? Uh, I mean, not in so many words, but I think it's implied every time that they're See, the, that I, they're I agree used, with that. Right? I think there's, you're not going to come to a verse right, that's going to be like, right. this is how... Now, First Enoch 15 is very clear of how they sure, came to be. Sure. That, that's clear. Sure. But biblically, you're like... No, but First Enoch really <laughs> is consistent with what we see. Yeah. But so let's talk about the distinction then uh, where why fallen angels are not demons. Let's talk about that. Okay, so if you understand Genesis 6 properly, then it's 
fallen heavenly beings that are called angels or sons of God or watchers, it's all a synonym, that see human women and they produce offspring. Those offspring are the Nephilim. These hybrids. The hybrids. Um, now, this again is universal. Everybody believed this, including the Greeks, although they didn't necessarily call them giants, but it, go read their stories of a mm-hmm. demigod, and that's yep. literally what they are. Um, they And it's not just there. I mean, it's the whole world believe yep. this. All, ain't Near East, ain't, you name it. Uh, you go over to consistent. South America. It doesn't matter where you're at. China, they all have the same idea that uh, the demigods are essentially these creatures that are we call demons. Uh, so what happens is that when a giant dies, you can read this in, even in, well, yeah, you can read it to some degree in Augustine, although he doesn't take giant, but he's wrestling with this, with this topic of what is a demon. Well, a demon's a spirit of the air. Why? Um, it's because uh, when it dies, where does it, where does it, where does it belong? Yeah. Like it's from, it's father's from heaven, naturally, and yeah. it's mother's from earth, so where does it belong? Well, it roams the air. And it, we know that it dies, it had physicality, and then it doesn't, but it has a spirit. It has a spirit, yeah. So, Just like in the flood. So let, let's put the context. In yeah. the flood, you have normal humans that die, their spirit goes somewhere, you know, Hades, okay? Uh, Luke 16, you can look it up, whatever. But then these physical giants that had a physical body, which are drowned, their spirit also goes somewhere. Yeah, and where does it go? It roams the earth. That's essentially it. They don't belong to any place, so they haunt. And because they had bodies... They seek to be embodied. To be embodied. Uh-huh. And angels never seek to be embodied because they have bodies. They can pull it and they whip it out. Right. This is 18, 19. They, they, they can, we can whip it out. Exactly. Where in the Gospels, just as Jesus said in Matthew 12, they go around, they seek. When they become disembodied, they go and they come back to the, you know, to the, to the one that, that was there. They seek to be embodied. Uh, I mean, even into the, sh- into the pigs that we saw, they, they didn't want to roam, whatever that, whatever that is, a very interesting passage, but they seek to be embodied. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so just, just understanding the nature of an angel, when, it, when the angels come to Abraham in Genesis 18, uh, one of them is the angel of the Lord, and then the other two are the angels that go to Sodom and Gomorrah, mm-hmm. well, he cooks a meal for them, and then he washes their feet, and then they have dinner together. Yeah. That, you, that does not happen with demons ever. Ever. Ever people, because they're ever. completely different. So I'm glad you brought this up because we were talking earlier that like this is the one thing when I hear people talking and, and they say uh, I can let a lot of things slide, but when they say <laughs> that angels and demons are the same thing, I'm like, no, they're not. not they're no, totally they're not. different. Yep. Although I will say one caveat: the word demon is sometimes used to refer to angelic beings. But it's not being used in a technical sense. It's being more used like we use it uh, as as an adjective, yeah. demonic. Demonic, yeah, yeah. And what 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 you see is interesting too, because in in my research, if you go, people can look this up. Is if you look at classical Greek um, and you look at the word daimon or daimon, daimonion, there was no not there wasn't any necessarily evil reference. It was kind of just a They're word neutral. for neutral. They were neutral. It was like it was like the word Elohim in, in, uh-huh. the, in the Old Testament. It's just neutral. You're like okay. So, but later now, it, certainly in the New Testament, that's not true. In right. The, New, the Testament, New Testament really changes yes. the way that this word is used. They're all evil. Always. Always evil. Uh, but again, classical Greek, not not the case. But in, in the same way, just in some of the Greek their own philosophies. Uh, they're just these spiritual beings. Um, and it's because the Bible's putting a, uh, a, a true spin on what they are. Um, so you're a Greek and you don't know God and you're trying to mess around with these powers that you don't understand and you see that sometimes they do good things for you. Yeah. And sometimes they are, they do, they're really bad. Yeah. And so that's just kind of the way a pagan mind would think when what the Bible comes along and says, you need to understand who these creatures are. These are evil Unclean, unclean spirits. Why yeah. are they unclean? Because there's a mixing of kinds. The same way that you're not supposed to mix two kinds of cloth yep. together, or you know, mix sow two different s- s- uh, seeds in the same field. It's a mixing of kinds. That's what a demon is. And the Bible does not view that as a good thing because it's a perversion of creation. And you look at in Luke chapter eight. Uh, it's the it's a it's a place where demon and unclean spirit are shown clearly by Jesus's words to be synonymous. Yes. And so that, that's, that's important for people to see that there is this, uh, I like that it's very helpful, the, the unclean nature of going back to the mixing of things in, in the Old Testament. And so as we think about um, this uh, and, and we think about the ways in which it's, it's, it, helps, it helps in some ways, but it doesn't. So uh, 
Another interesting passage that I find is, and it's again, not biblical, but it helps shape, it helps shape the understanding. For example, uh, I'll give two real quick examples. One, if you, if anybody wants to read Enoch and you go to 2 Peter 2, 4 or Jude 6, and you look at this language, chains of darkness, you know, where did Peter get this information? Right. And so... Uh, if you but if you read the the judgment of the, the Nephilim and the angels in in First Enoch one through fifteen and sixteen, you'll see that it's he's pulling they're both Judah they're pulling it right out of the darkness language the chains yeah. the, you know the chains language, okay, but in the book of Jubilees, chapter ten, uh, I think this is fascinating yeah. because mastema another synonym for Satan means hostility or hatred yeah is so, what his name means and he asks hey hey hey. Um, <laughs> these demons that are that are wandering, you know, God was going to send them down to Sheol and get them out of the world. And he says, can I have 10% right. <laughs> for my own purposes so I can tempt the sons of Noah right. you know, and humanity? And for whatever reason in the story, I'm not saying it's true, but it's interesting. It is very interesting. God says, sure, yeah, I'll give you 10% of these demons, these, these giants that their spirit, these, these, they're, they're spirits of the giants. And, and now they're meant, they're unclean, and they're meant to torment mankind. It's funny that it, most people quote that from Enoch. So the fact that you knew Jubilees 10, like that's on top of things. Yeah. That's exactly where this comes from. Yeah. The, the 10th idea is not found in Enoch. Yeah. Yeah. I've never, yeah, that's the only place I've seen it. And I've misquoted that myself. I'm like, and, and I don't think that's in Enoch. I'm mm-hmm. like, I keep, I can't find it, I, yeah. but it's in Jubilees. Yeah. It's, it, so it's amazing that you have this language that's being written there and the, the apostles, they're living in this world. These are the things that are, that are shaping their 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 thinking. So when they when they can write Second Peter two or Jude six, again we ask, where is Peter getting this information about right. chains right. and darkness? And you go, well, there's only one place that would be that we know of, at least now, at least uh, what we have is extant literature. Could well, even I mean, he, he, Peter Jude doesn't do this, but Peter uses the word tataros mm-hmm. uh, for where they went. Well, that's straight up Greek mythology, Hesiod stuff. Yep. Um, so. Uh, and that's the only time that that word appears in the New Testament. It appears a couple times in the Old and the Septuagint, but only time. Yeah. So why didn't he choose to say Hades? Why didn't he choose Gehenna? Yep. Like there's a reason for that, and it's because this is where the Watchers or the uh, Titans yep. uh, were enchained, imprisoned in the time of the flood, and it and everybody knew the story. Yeah. <laughs> and it's you know, so I think it's interesting too that. Uh, in one of the classes I taught was, you know, we know that Second Peter and Jude are, the context is against false teachers. Yeah. Okay, you know, he's, okay, these teachers, you know, they're going to get judged. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Just as. And so in the context of ju- false teachers being judged, both of them bring up, and the angels who sinned. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Why would he bring up angels sinning in the context of mm-hmm. false teaching? But yet if we go to the, the book of Enoch, we see that that's exactly what these false teachers were doing. You know, I love I love doing literary deep dives, and I'm preaching through Luke right now. And in Luke uh, 11, there uh, 10 and 11, there is four parallel units, and two of the parallel units are the climax, and one of them is the demon story with uh, Beelzebub, and it parallels the Pharisees and Jesus uh, pronouncing all the woes on them. Mm-hmm. It's ig- it, conceptually, it's exactly what Jude and Peter are doing because they're taking false teachers and they're connecting them theologically to the absolute worst supernatural <laughs> renegades that have ever existed. Yep. In the, <laughs> and, and in the context of teaching forbidden knowledge, right? I mean, I guess, you know, they're teaching them things about war uh-huh. that we're not allowed. And you're like, these, these, these fallen sons of God were teachers. And they were coming down and whatever that looks like, exchanging uh, forbidden knowledge when they shouldn't have. And God said, "That's again, that wasn't for them to know. And they did. And whatever they traded, they got a wife out of it <laughs> in, that, in that sense. <laughs> well, let's, if for this last segment here, uh, how does Genesis 6, I mean, Genesis, we have Genesis 3. We talked about the seed. We you know, come to Genesis 6. And then let's bring it right in. Let's bring Jesus and even a little bit maybe in John 10, Jesus is quoting Psalm 82. Let's talk about that in a sense, you know, and, and why they, that, that really roughed them up. Uh, they, they didn't like that idea. How does that, the whole theology of the divine council in Genesis 6, Deuteronomy 32, all of it, uh, Psalm 82, come into play in the mission of Jesus? And 
he doesn't reveal everything, but there's at the end in John 10, he, he's saying, hey, this is, this is what's going on yeah. and, and his mission. Let's talk about that. Uh, so it's very important to understand John is the one, first of all, writing John 10, obviously to state a tautology, but um, <laughs> I say that because he's the one who begins his gospel with, in the beginning was the Logos. Yeah. And then he starts talking about the name and the glory in that very same place. And he says, he says that um, people uh, knew him, but they did not worship him. And a lot of people say, oh, well, that's talking about Jesus when he came in the flesh uh, in earlier in his... No, it's talking about the Old Testament. Um, that's why he's using the language. So very important to know that because John's gospel is setting up exactly the question that you just asked. Throughout the gospel, Jesus starts using all these um, words and terms that were used in the Old Testament for the second power in heaven. Son of man language. The son of man, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. the son of God. So that's, in chapter 10, it's the son of God language. Mm -hmm. And we've already, you know, we've been talking about the sons of God. And in uh, when he says this to the, to the uh, Pharisees, and he's like, hey, you know, even your law says uh, <laughs> that there are gods. Where does he get that from? Well, it's not coming from the Pentateuch, it's coming from Psalm 82. Yep. And uh, sometimes the Psalms, sometimes the entire Old Testament is called the law. Yeah. That's just the way it is. And so he's quoting Psalm 82, 6 there. And if you understand the context of the whole Psalm, mm -hmm. it starts in the ESV, great translation, God is in the midst of the divine council, in the, in the, in the midst of the gods in the divine council, he's judging them. And then... Uh, that language, sons of God, that he quotes is one of those 10 or so stock phrases of that terminology that goes back to Genesis 6, that there are heavenly beings called sons of God, one of which in Deuteronomy 32, 9 is called Yahweh, and he inherits Israel. That's his portion. That's the language yeah, of it. Yeah. And this is very important to Psalm 82 because the last verse of Psalm 82, verse 8, is arise, O Elohim, and you will inherit the nations, or whatever that language yeah, is. Take, yeah, take Comes right rise, out of yeah. Psalm 2. Yep. Psalm 2 is like, hey, ask of me. And Psalm 82 is, now I'm going to give them to you. Yep. Take, so it's take, a what, take what I've promised. And so in the last verse, Elohim, well, who's that? Well, he's one of the sons of God. And who are those? Those are the guys from verse one that are in the divine council. So Jesus quotes this, and it blows my mind that people interpret this naturally as human rulers, as if Jesus is saying, hey, Pharisees, doesn't your own Bible say that you're a God? Why can't I be a God too? Exactly. Like that, what? <laughs> as soon as they hear it, they're like, they want to stone him for blasphemy. They'd be like, oh, you, you, so what, you're making yourself to be a human judge like what, Moses? Maybe? Exactly. No, no, he's like, no, I'm way, I'm, they wouldn't stone him for that. They wouldn't stone, they, it, all it does is make him more angry. Yeah. And then, and then just for good measure, oh. he jabs him and he goes, I and the father are one. Yep. In other words, I'm different than they are. There's something about me that's unique. I am the second power. Yeah. That's what they're saying. And they know full well what he's saying, as do a whole bunch of other people, because guess what? They convert to Christianity. Yeah. The question people don't ask themselves of the modern Jew is, how could somebody who's a Unitarian ever even contemplate Christianity? Doesn't make any sense. Nope. Because there can't be a guy who's God and equal with God if you're a Unitarian. Can't make sense. But if there's something in their theology that allows for that, which the entire Old Testament does, yep, clearly. and they knew it, and many, many Jews and rabbis are converting. This is what the book of Hebrews is all about. That's why I called it Hebrews, yep, <laughs> right? Yep. Um, if, you, if you find this guy deeply offensive and, in fact, ruining your religion and your power, guess what you're going to do? You can do everything in your power to stop that from happening. Well, and, and, and so going back, the, we mentioned earlier, too, is you know, Alan Segal's book, you know, The Two Powers of Heaven. What he does there, and you know this, but for those that don't, is he's he's highlighting, hey, hey, this was part of the original view, and and so the rabbis came along and basically did revision. They were revisionists par excellence at trying to remove the language, even I would say, even in the in the in the actual text of scripture, many times, um, to remove this idea that there was ever any even possibility of Daniel seven and others. You know, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's 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 fascinating that they're revisionists. 
They did some crazy things, Mondo. Uh, one of them is that they, and people wouldn't say, well, that, like, how, what does that matter? In the genealogies after the flood between Noah and Abraham, the Hebrew Masoretic has a certain number of years, and the Septuagint has 650 more years yeah. in it. Well, why? How do you just drop the word 100 out of six or seven um, guys in a genealogy? Well, I can tell you why. It's because the rabbis started claiming that Melchizedek was Shem. Yep, exactly. Well, what do you mean, Shem? Well, Hebrews comes along and says, Melchizedek doesn't have a genealogy. He doesn't have a father or a <laughs> yep. mother. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was all this speculation and view that Melchizedek was essentially uh, the prince of Israel. And that Abraham was bowing down to the prince of Israel. As a Christian, I would say he's Christ. And so they knew this. And so one of the things they did was, hey, let's just get rid of 600 years. And all of a sudden, Shem now overlaps. And we can say Shem is Melchizedek. Problem solved. Yeah, because before, Shem would have died way earlier, way earlier. before Abraham came <laughs> along. And then all of a sudden, because again, if you look at the Masoretic, uh, there is there is that difference, especially the time of the flood and everything else. And But what's interesting, too, is in thinking about that, when you look at the chronology or the, 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 the Samaritan Pentateuch, Josephus, uh -huh. and the Septuagint all line up against what we understand uh -huh. as the Masoretic text today, and even some others uh, that come later, and you're like... They did something, but they did it in order to repudiate the claim of Jesus' superiority. Again, it was all anti-Jesus, no doubt. Yeah, I want, I want to make – I don't get to plug these books very often. I did uh, – uh, I, I put three old Puritans into uh, uh, modern English and put a whole bunch of notes in them so people don't understand they are. And I put this in my Christ in the Old Testament series because I wanted people to see that essentially the Puritans knew exactly what Alan Segal finally figured out in 1977, but they knew it in the 16, 1700s. And they're, they're talking about two powers. They're talking about the Memra, the Logos, mm -hmm. the name, the glory, the whole deal. And they talk even about how the early Christians knew what the rabbis had done to the text, and they're writing this apologetic against it, saying, look, Christ is here in the Old Testament. And uh, they, I mean, it's just, it's amazing where, the things that we've forgotten. Where did the, in the sense of the Puritans, where were they getting their source material from? Uh, well, those guys were so genius. Uh, one guy, uh, Al Alex, uh, Peter Alex is his name, a, a totally obscure guy, wrote this mm -hmm. book, um, uh, and, a, and a little dissertation of it at the end on the angel, and that's what I put into a book for him. And this guy, when you read him, you're like, he knows English, French, Spanish, German, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, uh, and he had, you know, they have access to Oxford and you sure. know, all these books. And I don't know how they did it, but they did it. They did it. And they, they just knew. They knew what every Jew in the 1200s was writing. They knew what Jews in the 700s were writing. They knew what every church father was writing. And they're just able to pull these things and yeah, bring that's them together. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I can't even do it. I can barely do that with Google Books, <laughs> right? And yeah. they're doing it in a library where they have to go look them up. They have to go look, yeah. And, and we <laughs> can just pull it up and have them all open in tabs, just brrr, all the way along. Um, so, it, so we we come back. At, so let, let's. So Jesus comes and Jesus declares himself to be really the leader of the divine council. He's the. He's not just a son of God. He is the son of God. And even better, he's the son of man. Well, why does that matter? Well, we talked earlier about how the sons of God is title and language that comes to Christians. Well, it only comes to Christians as they're in Christ, because Christ is the second Adam. So if Adam was originally given a seat on the divine council and he was kicked off, that means is that God originally planned for us to at least co-rule yeah. uh, with them. Joy heirs. Yeah, and so yeah. it's not enough for the angel of the Lord to be God and and to defeat them in heaven, like Michael casting out the dragon, what I think that is. It's he has to actually become a human. And he has to do the things that Adam fell short of. And uh, you know, there's a whole thing with the uh, three temptations of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that are then replayed with Israel in the wilderness. Yeah. And then they're and replayed Jesus again even. with yeah. Jesus yeah. and the temptation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very deliberate because Jesus is is now obeying the law where um, all other men in all the other covenants have fallen short. And because he takes it all the way to death, even death on the cross and becoming a curse and a sacrifice and the whole deal, he then wins the right to regain that position as the second Adam on the council. And then, in just God's grace, 
he adopts evil, wicked Jews and Gentiles and saves them and brings them into the into this family, calling us sons and giving us a right to sit at the table of the divine council. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Well, and so it brings up Hebrews 2, where you have that language where he's going to speak about us and uh, where it says, I'll, I'll sing of his brothers or something like that. Yeah, this Psalm I'll, 22 stuff. Yeah. I'll, yep. I'll, and it's quoted in, in the book of Hebrews. You're, he's going to, he's going to mm-hmm. sing of, he's going to, he's, he's going to call us brethren, but in the midst of the council, he's going to speak of us. Yeah. And he's going to say, Hey, I, I got the renegades and I've paid for them. And they ha- now yeah. that we're coming in, as we said in first Corinthians six, three, that we're going to adjudicate angels. We're going to adjudicate the world. We're going to judge the world. We're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to Romans eight seventeen that if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified that we're joint heirs. We have all these rich promises, which again, this is why I see the problem sometimes is that in the new Testament, which is not a problem, but the sons of God language, as you mentioned in Galatians and Romans is then forced back, on the Old Testament, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's exactly right, and that's what they're that's what they're missing is that yep. it, is that it, it it hasn't happened yet. No, the but Old it Testament will language, happen. Yeah, the Old Testament yeah. language shapes the New Testament. That's exactly language. right. They're, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a whole plan of redemptive history that has to unfold before we yep. can become sons of God. So to read that back in is essentially to put the cart before the horse. Exactly, and they don't know that because they, right, you're like no, you're trying to humanize the sons of God. When in reality, that the, these sons of God were rulers. They, they're on the divine council, and we, we get. That. Right. It will happen. It will. Just not yet. <laughs> yes. For humans. Well, Doug, this has been this has been awesome. Uh, giants, sons of the gods. I mean, this is a tremendous work. Uh, I hope everybody gets it. And uh, again, tell people where they can find it. Like, one last time, where they can find all, more about it. Oh, at you. Amazon. You know, look up mm-hmm. any book that I have on Amazon. I think I've done like ten books or something. Mm-hmm. And then a few of those that we talked about with the Puritans and and just uh, you know trying to give people good theology is what I'm trying to do. But I dabble in normal things and I dabble in. Uh, this kind of strange, fun world, too. I would not call this dabbling. <laughs> I, I would say that you're, you're in deep, man, on this. <laughs> I, I probably am. I'm in too you deep. <laughs> so, DouglasVanDoren.com? And DouglasVanDoren.com, yeah. Awesome. Well, everybody, thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, we got into some good, deep stuff. And uh, again, continue to, to encourage you to look at, at Doug's stuff because you can go even deeper. So, appreciate you listening today and catch us next time.